What does the world's most popular hypervisor have to do with disco music? And how did five people start a multi-billion dollar company called VMware? In November of 1997, three Stanford University PhD students, Edward Bion, Scott Devine, and Kishna Govel, along with their professor Mendel Rosenblum, published a paper on running commodity operating systems on scalable multiprocessors. The idea was to take something they considered to be a bad idea from the 1970s, which was virtual machine monitors, and reapply it using 1990s tech. They called it Project Disco because the 70s music genre was making a temporary comeback at the time. The team's goal was to be able to run multiple copies of operating systems on a single computer. And with just 13,000 lines of code, the team was able to run multiple copies of Silicon Graphics IRIX OS on a single SGI Origin 200 machine. In 1998, Rosenblum, Devine, and Bouillon joined up with Diane Green, Mendel's wife, and Edward Wang, a fellow University of California Berkeley graduate, and together they founded the company VMware. VMware's first office was a 500 square foot space located above the Village Cheese House Deli in Palo Alto, California. They spent several weeks in this executive suite trying to get Windows 95 to boot on a Linux workstation. They had a particularly difficult time because Windows would just hang for no apparent reason during boot up. They generated gigabytes in logs that they analyzed with VI, and this had the team questioning if this whole thing was just a bad idea. But thankfully, they worked through the issues, and in March of 1998, the first Windows VM was started and took about 30 minutes to boot. Shortly thereafter, VMware grew to 16 employees, and they moved to a much larger 2,000 square foot office, affectionately known as the Crack House supposedly due to the state of disrepair that the building was in. February 1999 marked a major milestone at VMware when VMware 1.0, which is now known as Workstation, made its first public appearance at the Demo 99 technology conference. VMware 1.0 allowed users to run DOS, Windows, and Linux virtual machines on a Linux desktop. The product went into beta March 14, 1999, and had over 100,000 downloads before it went GA on March 15, 1999. One user even stated in an email, This is the coolest software I've ever seen. You guys must have brains the size of Volkswagens. VMware for Windows came out later that year on September 7th, but VMware didn't stop with desktops. They saw an even greater potential in the data center. In January of 2001, VMware released GSX Server. GSX was installed on top of a host OS such as Red Hat or Mandrake and even Windows a few months later, and supported DOS, Windows, and Linux VMs just like Workstation. Users could create and use VMs directly on the GSX host or install a remote console on a Workstation. There was also a web-based management user interface to manage those virtual machines. GSX also introduced the concept of undoable disks, where writes made to a disk are saved to a redo log, and the user could decide whether to discard or commit those changes, very similar to snapshots today. Just two months later, ESX was released as the world's first bare metal hypervisor, meaning it didn't rely on a pre-installed operating system. VM kernel-based architecture was introduced in ESX as a much more efficient way to deal with I.O. There was a service console, which was for all intents and purposes the operating system used to interact with VMware ESX and the virtual machines running on it. At normal runtime, the VM kernel would run on the bare computer and the Linux-based service console would actually run as the first virtual machine. And like GSX, there was a remote management console to use VMs as though you were sitting in front of a physical machine. The web-based MUI provided a bird's eye view of all the registered VMs and allowed users to start, stop, suspend, resume, and even reset virtual machines. But ESX and GSX were code names used for the private beta programs. The E stood for enterprise, S was for server, and X was for the x86 platform. But the G in GSX stood for workgroup. 
they didn't want to use W because they already had a product called Workstation and they didn't want to cause any confusion. VMware hired a new marketing firm to come up with the actual names for these products, and they ultimately came up with Elastic Sky and Groundstorm, which was later changed to Groundswell because, well, Groundstorm sounded too much like Desert Storm. But the names weren't very popular, and the products ended up launching with the beta names. In July of 2003, ESX2 introduced virtual symmetric multiprocessing, which meant that VMs could run up to two virtual CPUs so long as your server had two physical CPUs to support them. There was also another product making its way into customers' hands called VM Center, which was quickly changed to Virtual Center. Released in December of 2003, Virtual Center allowed for the management of multiple ESX and GSX servers from a single console. It was installed on top of Windows and leveraged an Access, SQL, or Oracle database and gave users standard management features, plus performance charts and alarms. But there was one feature that really blew everybody away, vMotion. vMotion was designed by Mike Nelson, who also designed the VM kernel. And this amazing new feature allowed for virtual machines to migrate from host to host without ever being interrupted. In 2004, VMware kicked off the first ever VMworld in San Diego, which was attended by 1,500 people. The big news of this event was that VMware had been acquired by storage giant EMC. June 13, 2006, ESX Server 3 was released alongside Virtual Center 2.0. This release introduced the concept of clusters and resource pools and technologies that could take advantage of the new cluster constructs such as Distributed Resource Scheduler, which balances workloads across all hosts in a cluster, and HA, which brings up VMs in the event that a host goes down. Virtual Center Client was also renamed to Virtual Infrastructure Client to convey its new ability to connect either directly to ESX hosts or to Virtual Center. But many years before ESX Server was released, VMware started researching a way to shrink the hypervisor. They removed a major source of size and complexity, the Linux-based service console. And they did this without losing any functionality such as vMotion, DRS, HA, Virtual Center manageability, and so on. This opened up the possibility of distributing ESX on flash memory installed inside of servers. And during VMworld in 2007, VMware announced a partnership with Dell to offer just that. On December 31st, 2007, VMware ESX Server 3i was released, with the I standing for integrated. In 2009, VMware announced its largest release ever. On May 21st, vSphere 4 was delivered to the hands of VMware's customers. vSphere bundled vCenter and ESXi and was called the industry's first ever cloud operating system. It took 1,000 plus engineers, 3 million engineering hours to deliver 150 new features, such as host profiles, vCenter server linked mode, vApps, centralized data store management, vSphere CLI, vSphere host update utility, vCenter orchestrator, fault tolerance, storage vMotion enhancements, enhanced vMotion compatibility, VMs with up to eight CPUs and 255 gigs of RAM, VMXNet 3, Direct Path I.O., Virtual Disk Thin Provisioning, and vNetwork Distributed Switch. vSphere 4 was a very important release as it laid down the foundation that modern day vSphere is built on top of. It also marks the end of ESX as 4.1 was its terminal release in 2014. vSphere 5 was the first release to be built exclusively for ESXi and was released on August 24, 2011. In it were some important new features like the vCenter server appliance and vSphere 5 web client that everybody knows and loves. Auto-deploy and storage DRS were introduced, and VMs could have up to 32 vCPUs and a terabyte of RAM. And what's more, vSphere 5.5 introduced vSAN, which could take the storage from multiple servers and create a single storage array. March 12, 2015 marked the debut of vSphere 6.0, which expanded the capabilities of vMotion to other vCenters. This was an incredible announcement because VMs could migrate to different physical data centers without downtime. Vault Tolerance was expanded to support VMs with up to four vCPUs for instant failover, and Instant Clone rocked the VDI world. 
vSphere 6.5 came out nearly two years later on November 15th, 2016, and brought with it a brand new HTML5 client for management. Metro vMotion was expanded to support longer distance migrations, and vCenter server appliances could be natively backed up and be made highly available. April 17, 2018, vSphere 6.7 was released and brought with it a number of security enhancements and the ability to suspend and resume VMs with GPUs, as well as cross-cloud migrations in hybrid linked mode, which allows enterprises to link two or more vCenters even if they're on different versions. But one of the coolest features is vSphere Quick Boot, which can restart the hypervisor without rebooting the physical host to significantly cut down on reboot times. The innovations just keep coming from VMware, and frankly, there are too many to list in this video. Thank you for watching, and if you like this video, click the subscribe button below. I'm Matt Bradford for VMSpot.